The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Renee, the editor of Blue Line, Canada's only independent magazine for law enforcement. When we started planning this webinar months ago, we, of course, had no idea it would end up happening the very same week of a related tragedy, the mass shooting on Sunday night in Toronto's Greek town. As we're still struggling to make sense of everything that's happened, we salute all the first responders who attended to the scene. We are reminded of how big a role our first responders play in these events and how important the corresponding training is for you all. A lack of preparation can be the difference between life and death. So during this one hour workshop, you will learn about how an integrated rescue system is a helpful way to prepare for mass casualty incidents. You will hear from both, both the police and firesides about establishing a nest or warm zone, rules and stabilizing an active threat scene, and much, much more. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can just type them into the question box on your panel. They will be answered at the end. If you don't have time to get to them all, we don't, don't worry, your answers will be emailed to you later. If you have to leave the webinar for whatever reason during the hour, don't sweat it. We are emailing out a link to all who register, featuring the webinar recording afterwards. Now, let me tell you about our amazing lineup of speakers. Constable Robert Daniel is the senior trainer for the RCMP's tactical training section, and he's based in Halifax. He has been a member of the RCMP for 19 years and involved in tactical training and tactical operations for the last 14. He is a national lead instructor and has instructed, instructed specialized military and police units internationally. Among his many roles and accomplishments, he was also part of a small team that designed and delivered the first mobile response team program as a result of the attack on Parliament Hill in 2014. Andrew Zavanatiz is currently the Deputy Fire Chief of Operations for the City of Vaughan Fire and Rescue Service in Ontario. He is proud to assist the fire chief in leading 343 career firefighters and staff. He joined the fire service in 1996 after working as a paramedic in Ontario and overseas. Andrew completed the Tactical Emergency Medical Operators course in 2002 in conjunction with Regional Police Services at Canadian Forces Base Newford, where he trained in active shooter and dynamic entry scenarios. This past June, our final speaker, Darren Rizzi, was appointed to the new, as the new Chief of Vaughan Fire and Rescue Service. Chief Rizzi has served as Deputy Fire Chief with the BFRS, having first joined the service in 2001 as a firefighter. The Chief's proven commitment to service excellence and public safety helped ensure that VFRS became the first fire department in Ontario to have all firefighters trained and tested for the National Fire Protection Association standard for technical rescue personnel professional qualification. The Chief's emergency management expert experience has al also includes serving as an operations officer with the Office of the Fire Marshal. And now, a message from our webinar sponsors. Central Lake Armor Express is a leading manufacturer and distributor of high performance body armor solutions, including rapid response equipment, ranging from multi-compliant ballistic armor packages, versatile outer carriers, lightweight helmets with extreme stopping power, and modular hard armor, all designed to provide officers the advanced protection they require when responding to an active shooter incident. Also, a special, a special shout out to Tajin Aramid for co-sponsoring this webinar. The Tajin Connex brand is a meta aramid that offers excellent resistance to heat, flame, chemicals, making it ideal for use in the manufacture of protective textiles and other industrial applications. With that, I will hand it over to Rob. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'd just like to thank Blue Line Magazine for putting this together. I think it's a timely and a very uh, important matter to be discussing. Before I get started, uh, I just want to let everybody know that's listening that we won't be discussing uh, tactics in this webinar. Um, most of the tactics, if not all, are protected and therefore uh, can't be shared. Um, but we will be talking about collaboration with our partners and uh, appropriate responses to, the, to these types of situations. Uh, and if you could go to the uh, IR definitions for me on the PowerPoint. 
so as you can all see on your screen there, uh, we define as, as a policing agency active threats as one or more individuals who seek out an environment that offers multiple victims for a purposeful killing spree. The active threat is a real present and credible threat that has shown the determination to injure or murder those individuals. What, we're meaning, what we mean by that uh, is that it doesn't, murder, death, kill does not have to be occurring for us to deem it an active threat. Uh, if we have credible information that would lead us to believe that this individual or individuals are seeking that type of environment out, then we will categorize that as an active threat and respond with uh, immediate action rapid deployment, which as you can see on your screen is a swift and immediate deployment of law enforcement resources to an ongoing life-threatening situation where delayed deployment could otherwise result in grievous bodily harm and or or death to innocent people. We've learned in our history and our past that any delayed type of response uh, just contributes to the body count, contributes to the injured parties, and uh, that that is just unacceptable in our society anymore. We have to uh, respond quickly and deal with that threat appropriately uh, based on a proper risk assessment. Uh, Andrew, can you continue the next slide, please? So as you can see here, I have innocence and on the next point, bullet point is victims. So when we look at the two types of categories here, innocence are persons that are in an active threat environment, but have neither physically observed or been a part of the active threat violent act. Innocents are part of the event, but are not considered witnesses. The reason I put that in here is because as first responders, when we go to this, these types of events, these people could be shepherded out relatively quickly, or they could be people that have already left the infected area and could be running into our, uh, our other first responders, EHS and fire. Uh, they could be in shock, but they don't have any visible injuries. And uh, we don't want to confuse them with the victims. And those are persons that are in the active threat environment and have physically observed or have been the recipient of the violent acts committed by the active threat. These individuals will require uh, trauma first aid potentially, or some type of, of first aid from our first responders and our law enforcement personnel. And we want to try to, even though we have to control both parties, we want to be able to distinguish between the two and and uh, and and deal with them accordingly in our trauma care. Uh, Andrew, could you go to the next slide, please? So. As you can see here, the, we talk about the transition from active threat uh, or the violent shift. That point in the incident where the active threat stops his, her, or their personal skills free and barricades themselves with or without hostages. This transition uh, allows us some time and opportunity. It can very easily transition back to an active threat, but one, it, there's times where the, the, the uh, perpetrators would barricade themselves and our response would have to change accordingly. This could provide us time to uh, establish rescue teams, have them deploy, remove uh, victims or shepherd the innocent to our first responders uh, and, and deal with it. But if the transition goes back, then the situation would now revert back to our immediate action rapid deployment protocols and, uh, and we deal with it accordingly. So, Again, making contact with the active threat. The point of the incident where the contact team makes a visual of the active threat or the perceived active threat. That contact is what we're seeking. We're looking to make contact, keep contact, advance to that threat, and, and, and stop that threat by whatever means are deemed necessary at the time of the engagement. Um, there's times where the visual cues may not be there. It does not mean that our progress Ends. We will continue to seek out that threat based on many different factors. Uh, the victims or witness accounts to where that threat may be located, intelligence led through uh, our dispatcher, uh, many other factors, noise, chaos. Uh, oftentimes, you will have an indicator uh, when you see people running from a certain location, uh, even though you don't hear anything, but other, other than seeing the visual effects of that, those individuals running away, that's a great indicator that your threat might be in that location and you will proceed to that, that spot and in essence make that contact. Go ahead, Andrew, to the next slide, please. So our timeline of violence. This is the moment that the perpetrator or the perpetrators is identified as a potential active threat by a witness until he, she, or they are stopped. 
So again, when I spoke earlier about our definition of active threat, that's when the timeline of violence begins for police. The moment we receive the call that we have a potential threat, active threat by whatever means, whether it be with a firearm, with a knife, with a vehicle, with IEDs, regardless of the mechanism, the threat is credible and real, and the timeline of violence begins at that moment. Uh, and that is our response. That's when we head in, that's when we continue and tell that threat, uh, the perpetrator is stopped or, or the perpetrators are stopped. Go ahead to the next one. A green corridor. This is an indicator of uh, an evacuation corridor that has been used and is confirmed safe and protected by the police officers. All police officers should use this corridor until ERT or EDU, the, our disposal unit, have done a complete sweep of the building and has been confirmed clear for major crime investigators to assume responsibility. So the green corridor uh, is as safe of a passageway as you can create in and out of the infected area. Um, typically, it will start at the at the at the the most visible entrance way to your infected area, whether it be a school, a hospital, or wherever you deem the appropriate entry point is. That corridor will begin as the team advances throughout, seeking out that threat. Uh, the green corridor can establish our path of least resistance and allow our teams to move somewhat freely. The word safe, I use cautiously because until that building has been completely cleared, uh, the environment isn't safe. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, into the webinar is what we mean by our zone areas. Go to the next uh, slide, please, Andrew. Thank you. So as you can see here, we have this concept of nesting. There's an optional tactic whereby victims that require immediate medical assistance are gathered in a police officer's protected area or room and medical personnel are escorted to the victims in need of immediate medical care. The purpose is to triage those that would otherwise be jeopardized through time loss if egregious to awaiting paramedics and transported to medical facilities. Whether it's established while an active threat event is still ongoing or after the event has stabilized, it must be protected and defendable from the attack. This is a situation where uh, if you look at historically some of the uh, active threats that we've had, uh, I'll bring up Virginia Tech as an example. Virginia Tech is a massive campus and, and some of the image that we saw from Virginia Tech, you could see you know, three, four police officers extracting victims from that area and they would struggle to carry these individuals to where our first response, first responders and medical personnel were located, which could be a kilometer away, depending on the environment you're dealing with. Um, that could cause undue hardship on our police officers, but more importantly on the victims and the innocent people that, that were there to protect. So we will harden down a location in close proximity to where the threat may be and shepherd or bring our medical personnel to that hardened location where we will nest and they can begin their medical triage at that point there. Uh, again, it is a concept. Not every situation is going to call for nesting, depending on the situational factors that, that each individual is faced with. You're going to have to determine through your own risk assessment what, what the concept is that you are going to deliver based on the totality that you're, that you're looking at. Go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to just wait there and I'm going to explain a few other little things that are on the PowerPoint that I'd like to talk about as part of the webinar. Um, we talk and what the webinar is, the purpose of this webinar is, is in order for us to collaborate as agencies and best plan out a response to these active threats. Some of the things I want to talk about uh, is training. Um, the first point is training can be very complicated or can be very simple. Um, what I mean by that is if you look at simple tabletop exercises where you write out a scenario on a board and you sit around as multiple agencies and determine what your roles and responsibilities are in relation to that scenario. Now, we all know that it's impossible to tabletop every type of scenario that could occur because as soon as we do that, someone's going to come up with a new way of hurting people and we've mistakenly focused our, our training on just one way. We need to think globally. We need to think universally. Uh, we need to come up with plans that would best suit 
uh, a totality of situations. So tabletop exercises are a great way of doing things. Uh, and then of course, scenario-based training is also a phenomenal way of doing things where we bring all our partners and shareholders together and establish a scenario that we would need to respond to. With active threats, it is the police officers and the police policing agency's responsibility to deal with that situation. But to make sure that our partners, fire and EHS, are informed and that we have an open line of communication between the two. A lot of things that we could be doing to utilize that partnership, uh, we talk about breaching, for example. If there's situations where you can't make entry into an infected area and you don't necessarily as a frontline officer have the breaching equipment required, well, I'll guarantee you that fire will. And uh, understanding how that equipment works and having a collaboration with our partners in the fire department could mean the difference between additional injured or killed people. Knowing how to use that equipment, knowing how to access that equipment, knowing how to communicate with our partners in order to get that equipment to the front line where we need it in order to make entry into that area is, is critical. Um, there's other issues where you look at is fi is fi who's, who's responsible here? What if we have an active shooter or an active threat simultaneously going on while the, the infected area is actually on fire? Um, who, how do we deal with those types of situations? These discussions need to be had in order to best resolve a, a terrible situation that could occur at any time. Um, I'd like to get into a situation that happened in our own country, in Saskatchewan, in Lalash at the school shooting. I think you're all familiar with it. Uh, one of our members had entered the building on their own. Their wife was a teacher in that area. Shots had been fired. They responded appropriately and made an entry into the, into the school. While they were making the entry into the school and other units were arriving, other police units were arriving, fire had already arrived on scene. And members from the community who were getting emails or sorry, text messages from their kids in the school had come to the school armed with long guns and wanted to make an entry into that school themselves. The fire department held them back and stopped them from making that entry. And it's a good thing that they did because if they would have went in with plain clothes and long guns and a member would have come across them, we would have had a very bad situation. Now, let me be clear on something. I don't suggest that our fire and EHS people deal with armed uh, individuals, but in this particular situation, the fire department felt that they needed to intervene and they did appropriately, and, and it's a good thing that they did. So with that example, let's remember that every situation is going to dictate a different type of response. We need to be prepared for that, and our fire department and our EHS have to uh, we have to all work together in order to come to a positive result. Um, school action for emergencies or the SAFE plan is the last thing I want to talk about. This is a great plan. I don't know if people are familiar with it or not. That allows you to have access to a uh, database and a, a, that could come up on your mobile workstation, your police car, that your dispatchers could have that has a view of where staging areas would occur, where uh, EHS would mask, even where media and collection points for parents arriving on scene uh, would attend in order to control the environment. Uh, you'd have observation points for your emergency response team. You'd have sniper points, uh, a, a number of different things that are pre-planned that are on your MDT, on your mobile workstation that you can access or your site commander can access in order to have their resources deployed appropriately. This type of uh, program is acceptable not only for schools, but airports, hospitals, uh, stadiums, you name the environment, and you can apply this program. It's a great program. I've used it several times. I've actually used it in real deployments, and it has worked really well. Um, I could go on. I'm, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, what I want to do now, though, is I want to bring my partners in if they want to add anything. Uh, by all means. Thank you, Constable Daniel. I think um, we'll move on. Thank you so much. In the recent incident in Toronto tragically demonstrates we continue to face ongoing threats in an uncertain world. Active shooter events, the use of improvised explosive devices, otherwise known as IEDs, 
and the threat of complex coordinated attacks must be considered as at least plausible, if not probable. It has become evident that these events may take place in any community impacting fire, police, and EMS departments, regardless of their size or capacity. Local jurisdictions must build sufficient public safety resources to handle active shooter and mass casualty scenarios. Local fire, EMS, and law enforcement must have common tactics, communication capabilities, and terminology to have seamless, effective operations. They should also establish standard operating procedures for these very volatile and dangerous situations. The goal is to plan, prepare, and respond in a manner that will save the maximum number of lives possible. A pre-planned integrated response by all first responder disciplines is required in order to maximize effectiveness and improve the survivability of those injured in such attacks. While there is no one size fits all solution to the challenges of integrated response, there are already fire services of different sizes and compositions from rural to urban, volunteer to paid and everything in between who have done a lot of groundwork towards developing an integrated response. Today, we will stress the importance of relationship building between police, fire, and EMS agencies that are formed and enhanced during pre-planning and training, which will pay great dividends during response to these types of incidents. Although this disclaimer was made at the beginning of the presentation, again, this is an open forum, meaning the general public are able to access this presentation. As such, discussions in regards to specific and detailed integrated response tactics have been removed from our PowerPoint presentation. Although overall fire service operational priorities are unchanged for most routine incidents, which include life safety, incident stabilization and property conservation, an active shooter mass casualty scenario, the life safety and incident stabilization will be the focus of the operation. The key thing to remember when responding to these incidents is that law enforcement is the lead agency in preparing for and re responding to an active shooter incident. Fire departments and EMS agencies act in a critical support capacity. So today we're going to be talking about common language definitions, local policies and procedures, and actions. So keep in mind that this will vary from province to province, jurisdiction to jurisdiction, and each province will be impacted by the legislation uh, differently. And for fire services, keep in mind we all have ENR bylaws, and what uh, ENR bylaws will do is that they um, they identify the level of service that each fire service will respond to. Thanks, Chief. Uh, it's Andrew Zvanitez here, the Deputy Chief for the City of Vaughan. I'm going to take over for the Chief and just go through a few quick definitions so everybody can be speaking the same language. And it's no different than a fire operation where you may go from municipality to municipality or within your region, you'll find a lot of common themes in these terminologies. So the first one uh, is actually active attacker. And as the constable mentioned, this is an armed person who is using or has used deadly force on other persons and continues to have access to additional victims. You may see that as an active, uh, called an active shooter, but that's your, that's your threat. A uh, contact team, as mentioned, is the initial direct action group with the law enforcement agency that'll be uh, in your region or municipality. This is comprised of police only. Uh, these, these officers will group together immediately upon arrival. They'll do their size up. They'll take whatever action they deem necessary to immediately enter and begin to isolate or, uh, or apprehend their attacker. And typically that is only armed police officers and they will be entering what we will call the hot zone and we'll touch on that in a few minutes as well. So a rescue team is, is uh, a team that's made up of police officers who are now actually going to go in and try to do some triage and find those injured, wounded, critically, uh, critically injured people. Typically this team is inserted behind the contact team either when the threat has been eliminated or contained. So you may in some instances see if a fire department is using a rescue task force model, you may see a special operations medic or special operations firefighter. Again, totally dependent on the service you're providing in your area. So 
they may uh, enter in a diamond formation with the medics and the fire asset uh, in the middle. They're protected by the police officer and their goal is to uh, perform immediate life-saving treatments such as uh, stopping uh, massive bleeding and start to evacuate pe people from the hot zone. The casualty collection point, this is what the constable referred to as nesting. This is an area outside the hot zone to which casualties are taken. So you might be performing an emergency drag as a firefighter or a medic, bringing people to where they can start to get primary BLS or ALS care, but in a much more contained or safe environment. And this is the most likely area we'll see fire departments operating within. And we're gonna call this the, inter the interface between the cold and the warm zone, or perhaps the, war the, uh, the warm zone itself. <clears throat> in this zone, there's a great acronym uh, I stole from our regional police and it's the HAIR. So this stands for hemorrhage, airway and rapid extrication. If nothing's on fire and we have no rescue to perform, we'll be assisting our paramedics and in these four, these four competencies. Uh, this is how you save lives in a situation like this, stopping gross bleeding, opening an airway, getting someone out of harm's way so they can get that good primary ALS and BLS care away from the uh, threat. We're going to set up a staging area <clears throat> that is defined as where resources assemble and form, which are uh, which are provided assignments and deployed. These are where your 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 third, fourth, and all your other assets are going to arrive. The ambulance will set up a patient care sector. Fire department will assist with manpower there, and this is where they'll start to do a formal triage, decide who's going to go first and where. Um, and this is typically in the cold zone, or perhaps even at the interface to the to the outer perimeter. This is an interesting term. You may find it uh, in different types of literature defined differently, uh, a systematic search or clearing. The best way I can put it to fire department personnel is this is the equivalent of your primary search in a house fire. You are doing a quick search of a building to make sure there's no one you can save immediately, but you are not saying that that house is entirely clear. We know that's not the case until you perform a secondary search. So once the shooter has been inactivated, but has not been located, they may have him contained. They can tell you as the fire department, the first floor is, is clear, we've searched it. By no means are they, are they giving you 100% guarantee that there will not be a threat there. They could have a injured person who was, uh, uh, sorry, a threat who's masquerading as an injured person and trying to dupe or perform a ruse on the law enforcement personnel to now escape the scene. But the threat is definitely lowered in the warm zone. So when you hear the term clearing or searching, it's best to define with your allied agencies locally or regionally what they're, what they're meaning when they use those terms. So the hot, warm and cold zones are what firefighters will be familiar with through hazardous materials application. We utilize this, this format because it works. So our, our hot zone is any area accessible to or currently be utilized by the active attacker or shooter. This is not a place firefighters will typically operate unless they get caught there. Firefighters typically will not operate in the hot zone. It requires hours and years of upgraded training, ballistic protection, and uh, usually you're accompanied by a firearm uh, bearing person in that zone. So the warm zone, area where a potential threat exists, but the threat is not direct or immediate and the area is controlled by law enforcement. So a perfect example of that would be at a school Typically the administration offices are all, always located on the first floor. If law enforcement enters and they clear that area and they say we control it or we own the admin area, we need you to come up and help with triage or patient removal. We have uh, critical, critically injured people here. You would advance to the warm zone under the protection of police officers. They're not just gonna leave you there. They're gonna say we, we control this area. We have patients here that you can help. And in the fire department, I. I think that's your work. You go up and you help those people, you assist your medics, and whether it's rapid extrication or applying the HAIR acronym for uh, stopping hemorrhaging, opening airways, that's where you wanna be operating. The cold zone is the area obviously outside the perimeter, just like it is in the, uh, in the hazmat uh, application. You're outside the perimeter and it contains your command post, your unified command uh, officers, and it could be where your casualty collection point or your major triage and patient care area will be. This is typically where a lot of the walking wounded or the green tags would show up. 
There's the, a, uh, sorry, Chief, sorry yeah. I'm just going to talk. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the NFPA right there. So the NFPA 3000 standard for an active shooter hostile event response, or we call it the ASHER program. The ASHER document clearly outlines the duties and responsibilities of fire and EMS personnel in the critical hot, warm, and cold zones of a mass casualty incident. So if you have uh, the NFPA 3000 in front of you, you can reference page 30. So section A 13.3.1.1, it describes the current understanding that fire and EMS do not typically operate in a hot zone. It's understood that different municipalities and jurisdictions could have the ability to do so as part of a special team. This is in reference to departments where firefighters and paramedics are integrated into specialized training assignments, equipment and duties. So for example, Ottawa Fire Department currently has an integrated model with 10 firefighters trained to be part of an ERU integrated team. Currently they're recruiting six more members. The NFPA 3000 document defines fire and EMS roles and responsibilities in life saving situations in hot and warm zones where law enforcement may not have been given the all clear. This is a departure from traditional standards where wounded and injured may be in need of help but cannot be seen or evacuated by medical support personnel as the scene is not secure. The new guidelines suggest just that should a situation evolve and fire and EMS personnel find themselves inside such perimeters with an active shooter, they may remain and render aid as long as law enforcement is providing active force protection in the form of a rescue task force. So the way it was explained to me, and maybe uh, Constable Daniel can um, jump in on this, if for example, this is a, a shooting in a mall and say, for example, the food court has been rendered as clear, uh, firefighters could and, and EMS paramedics could enter it as long as they have protection from law enforcement and, uh, and they're protected on various angles. Yeah, that's a great point, Chief. Uh, what we would do, and like you had said, and like your, like your manual says there, is we would harden down that location. Uh, we'd, we'd set perimeters, we'd have uh, police covering all entrances, angles and arcs, uh, in order to make sure that that area uh, is well in hand so that our partners can operate uh, as they need to to deal with the casualties that that are on hand with with uh you know without having to worry about about uh potential threats coming at them you know that that's something that we refer to as indirect casualty care because we're not in direct contact with the, with the threat however if for some reason uh, we do make contact with the, with the original threat or potentially a second threat, then there would be the responsibility of that, that perimeter team to deal with that threat, whether they're in a rescue capacity uh, or if they're just holding a post. So their priority would quickly switch from uh, protecting those people on the ground to dealing with that threat now uh, in order to avoid them moving into another area that's been unsecured where they could potentially have access to more victims or, or uh, individuals that are unaware. That's, uh, that's great. Thanks, officer. The, uh, the, the slide on the screen now should look very familiar to fire department personnel as it, uh, it pretty much duplicates our hazmat hot, warm and cold zone. Obviously the red is the hot zone and that is where the police officers that are armed will be initiating contact with their suspect. The unified command section of the warm zone, the yellow, you may see fire department and EMS resources working in there. And that can be, as, as the officer described, we need, we need bolt cutters, we need forcible entry, something's on fire, come up. We need something that you have. And it may be just you go up and give it to them and then go back. They say, we don't, we don't clear the spice yet. We don't want you operating up here. Um, again, it's follow your local, uh, your local protocols for that. And then the yellow zone, if we're conducting our hair acronym or we're doing rapid extrication, this is where we're gonna, as many times as we need to go up and pull people back to the edge of the warm where it meets the cold zone so we can start getting our, uh, our casualty collection point. And it's important to remember this whole, this whole slide could be in a, a 200 meter range inside a school or it could be half a kilometer. It's gonna depend on the event you're at, how big it is. We saw in Toronto um, patients scattered for almost a kilometer down Young Street uh, where they had 10 fatalities and obviously a, a very big scene and also a very big crime scene and things to consider when you're responding to these events. 
So the next slide uh, we're going to talk about is what's called the reverse triage effect. And most studies from mass shootings have shown that casualties that only sustain minor injuries or that are uninjured will self-evacuate. And if you've ever seen a video uh, from Columbine or any of the mass shootings, people will scramble for their lives. And if they have minor injuries, they will self-evacuate. And typically those will be the first people that the initial initially responding uh, paramedics and firefighters and police officers will encounter. Police are trained to go past those people and they will just keep going. So the first arriving fire officers and uh, companies and paramedics will encounter these very minor injuries or perhaps just uh, people that are psychologically stressed at that time from the, uh, from the incident. And you, you immediately start going to the first person you see. However, there's gonna be a lot more injured people behind them. And that's why they call it the reverse triage effect because you get sucked in to treat five or six green tags or people who don't need a lot of your resources or care. And then all of a sudden you get, you get your ambulances uh, and your, your fire department crews tied up with these people. And then you get brought uh, arterial bleeding, major respiratory or critical injuries that you need to deal with. So it just creates uh, a bit of confusion. And if you have a planned and orderly response initially, and you know that that could happen, that's the first step in, uh, in beating the reverse triage effect. So just wanna mention uh, really in 1999, I don't think there's anybody who doesn't know about the, uh, the Colorado shooting at Columbine High School where uh, the two students planned their operation for a year and they eventually plotted to blow up the school and kill all 500 students. They, they, did, they did kill 23 and wound 23, excuse me, kill 14. But this was the watershed event that changed the way first responders approached to active threat incidents. Police globally um, and from everyone I've talked to have said this was the event that changed the way police officers first interact with a threat. And they have now said, we are gonna intervene immediately. We're not gonna wait. So that's changed our approach and it's changed the approach for the, for the EMS systems. And depending where you live, it may be a complete 180 from what you've done before. Now we're no longer waiting and, and barricading ourselves. We're going in and maybe the officer can jump in. I believe the logic here is if you're, if you're looking at the police or you're running from the police, you're now long, no longer a threat to, uh, to the civilians in the building. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. That, that's exactly right. If we are engaged with that threat by whatever means, even, even visual or verbal engagement through our presence, when we arrive on scene, we arrive loud, we arrive heavy. Uh, there's nothing stealth about our approach to active threat because we want to deter their, or take their attention away, I should say, from their victims and on to us. So like you said, it was a great way to, if they're running away from us, they're not necessarily engaging innocents. So yes, uh, yeah, that's exactly the mentality. Excellent. So, so what do you do? You're a fire department. How are you gonna approach a plan? What's the model? What's the template? The first thing you're gonna do, like any good fire department, is you're gonna plan and you're gonna talk about policy and I'll turn it over to Chief Rizzi to, to address this. So by its nature, an ASHE incident, and when I say ASHE, I mean active shooter hostile event, may require multi-agency, multi-discipline, and depending on the extent of the incident, multi-jurisdictional response. A comprehensive ASHE plan must be developed collaboratively by representatives of all organizations covered in the plan. A good rule of thumb is do not include people in your plan, include them in the planning. An ASHE plan must address the capabilities and resources available and offered from within and outside each agency and jurisdiction. Being involved in the planning increases familiarity with the plan and commitment to executing the plan. A comprehensive plan provides a framework for developing and implementing specific procedures, including training and exercising your capability, equipping your response elements, proactive engagement of your stakeholders, and evaluating your capabilities. It is critical that your senior leadership understand and support the comprehensive ASCG plan. Without their active support, the planning process and any subsequent response will be jeopardized. As part of the planning process, formally document the resources and commitments each agency and jurisdiction make to the planning process and execution of the plan in the event of an ASHE incident. Develop MOUs so that your memorandums of understanding between each agency and jurisdiction included in the comprehensive plan. A comprehensive ASHE plan and all associated procedures must ensure a consistent and uniform approach to planning and responding to an ASHE incident. 
The policies contained in the plan should support operational principles that encompass integrated response operations. Policy should support training and exercise requirements. The policy will be committed to and incorporated by all agencies and jurisdictions. Training exercises support cross-agency awareness, interaction, integration, and cooperation. So I referenced earlier the NFPA 3000. So on May 1st, 2018, the National Fire Protection Association NFPA released NFPA 3000, standard for an active shooter hostile event response, otherwise known as ASHA program. This standard details how fire departments and EMS agencies can aid in the preparation, response, mitigation, and recovery of a situation involving a mass shooting or other mass casualty incident. This document opens lines of communication before, during, and after events and outlines roles and responsibilities. The result is less likelihood of duplication of effort in chaotic environments. Thanks, Chief. So this, this is an excellent document. Like any NFPA publication, it really provides a template that you can apply to your community. And not every piece of it is gonna to apply to every community. That's why it's important that you take a look at it. But it is a, a great model. Um, it's gonna walk you through a literal checklist of assessing your community, aligning your needs, planning and educating. It's gonna to speak to the authority having jurisdiction. It's gonna to talk to you about planning and the administration of that. Um, this is where you're going to do a, a gap analysis for your community and you're going to do a risk assessment. You're going you're gonna to find out exactly what your threat level is. You're going to use your Eisenhower matrix and find out is this a, a, a threat in our community? How often is it going to happen? The biggest portion of this document are the competencies, section 13. This would be, if I can compare it to a, a guideline that the firefighters and fire departments might, might be aware of, it's the one that tells you how to do your work. And that delineates you know, to exactly what standard of helmet you're going to wear, what kind of gloves you're going to wear, and that is the biggest uh, the biggest piece. It speaks to the equipment, the resources, the training, the integration with your allied agencies, and of course it it always touches on funding for things like that. Um, your community it talks about recovery plans for for your citizens. It goes so far as to as to say providing uh, your Red Cross with uh, mental health counseling for your citizens or affect as well as the responders. It talks about recovery not only for the community but also for first response agencies. If you look at the fire departments that responded in Saskatchewan to the uh, the hockey team, every single one of those responders is uh, is being tended to by the province and by the municipality for care after the event resource management as well, tackling things like tracking down funding, getting integrated training. These are not small pieces and it's not anything to take lightly when you take on these programs. But as the authority having jurisdiction, that's you are the people that will decide what services you're gonna you're gonna provide to your uh, your citizens in your in your region. So the NFPA 3000 speaks to four main concepts in every section and it's the whole community unified command, integrated response, and planned recovery. And more and more, when I speak to my counterparts in allied agencies, the unified command and the communication piece is the first thing we mention. The more and more you work with your, uh, your allied agencies, whether it's law enforcement or paramedics or fire service, the more comfortable you get with each other's uh, methods, your procedures. And the first time you go to one of these calls, you certainly don't wanna have never spoken or, or talked about any of these incidents. Planning for these uh, responses is definitely something that you wanna be prudent. And I think it, it's it's incumbent upon all, all first response agencies now to be having these conversations. So we'll get the, the role of law enforcement on their arrival has a few key features and they're gonna locate isolate and apprehend their suspect. I'm gonna ask uh, Constable Daniel to jump in here and just add a little more context to that as far as the first arriving officers and their role on uh, on scene. Thanks, Deputy. Um, so the law enforcement arrival on scene is gonna be a, a somewhat of a tiered system. Initially, the first arriving officers may actually assume uh, an, an ad hoc or, or, or a pinch and command role um, depending on the situational factors that they're presented with. With what we look at and how we look at it universally or globally, typically uh, the first arriving officer may only have another arriving officer shortly there behind them. You don't typically have a full team of potentially four members showing up. So what would happen is your telecoms or dispatcher may assume 
an ad hoc instant command role while you and your partners respond to locate that suspect. Locating the suspect can be based on many factors. Intelligence led uh, through, uh, you know, audio clues such as gunshots or screaming, uh, uh, individuals fleeing a certain location, uh, last known contact through, through uh, 911 calls and, and witness accounts. Once the suspect is isolated, now isolated could take on many roles. Could, did they transition to an armed barricaded person? Have they taken hostages or are they continuing their killing spree? When you contain the, the individual or individuals who are on this, uh, are uh, executing their plan of uh, mass casualties, the isolation piece is feeds right into the apprehension. The apprehension of the suspect could take on many roles. One, they surrender, they've taken their own life and, you, and you've taken that, that individual into custody or you have to uh, exact some level of force in order to stop them. And that force is, is, is whatever you deem appropriate and necessary at the time. Thanks, Andrew. That's great. Super, thanks, officer. So the fire department response or your role on arrival, um, well, again, these situations are extremely dynamic. They have to be fluid. That's why the templates are so broad but you immediately want to establish contact or communication with what you perceive to be the lead police officer or NCO uh, to establish that communication link. And that can be as simple as, we're here, what have you got? What do you need from us? And that, that piece is so often overlooked by first arriving company officers or chiefs or platoon chiefs. We need to get out of our vehicle, make contact either through dispatch on the radio. If he says, I need you a kilometer back, then that's where we should stage. If he says, no, we have a barricaded suspect, and I need you to get your trauma kit and come wait behind my car, I'll tell you when it's safe, then that's what we do. We wanna immediately start identifying perimeters. We wanna identify where the hot, warm, and cold zones. And those are terms you can use with the bulk of officers in Canada now. They will be familiar with the hot zone is where the bad guy is, the warm zone is where I'm gonna start helping people, and the cold zone is the outer perimeter. Those are terms you can use when you interface with, uh, with law enforcement at these scenes. You wanna work within those established perimeters to assess and treat life threat injuries. As the fire department resource on scene, unless we're actively rescuing someone, suppressing a fire or helping them with breaching, that is our goal is to support EMS with, uh, with life threatening injuries. We're gonna work cooperatively with law enforcement and EMS obviously in rescuing or providing collection teams. It could become manpower intensive very quickly. And obviously, uh, as the officer mentioned, um, if they need a piece of equipment that only we have, we're gonna provide that. This is, uh, this is a great opportunity even in training to show them how, how a, a set of bolt cutters works or, or a cordless, uh, cordless spreaders so they can get into a building or take that in with them if they have somebody barricaded. Um, just anecdotally, we had a call in my, my municipality where we interfaced with the, uh, the regional police uh, with a fantastic outcome because the first two check marks on that list were done very well. The two tactical level officers met with, uh, with our platoon chief. They got a plan together. We gave them some equipment to help mitigate a threat and it worked out beautifully because we did the first two things very well. We had great line of communication from the get-go. So you need to be ready. The timeline of some of these active threads are, are as recent as last Saturday. You need to be having these conversations with your senior management, with your health and safety, with your municipality. If you're not, when they happen, Everyone's going to point their finger and say, you weren't ready. You didn't, you didn't, you haven't even talked about it. You want to conduct training. You want to start having contacts with your allied agencies. Um, these, these events, unfortunately, are, are becoming more and more prevalent. And it's prudent upon all first responders to absolutely um, start, start the conversation. Look at that guideline from the NFPA and start, start planning. Um, you need to build bridges with your local partners. I know the chief, I, I probably speak on her behalf, we're extremely par proud of the relationship we have with York Regional Police, specifically four district, they police our, uh, our municipality. Um, they, they've got some excellent production um, for, uh, for videos, for training. We integrate with them through a memorandum of understanding. We provide support to them when requested uh, for pre-planned events and uh, our, our training. Our commitment to them is financial, it's labor, and it is uh, equipment. You need to be getting out and talking to your regional or municipal or provincial police saying, what do you expect from us when this happens? That's really the main thing. And I, we, we hope, I think, out of this whole presentation is to start stimulating conversation locally, municipally, provincially. I know they, the RCMP officer said his, his vision is federally that 
nobody gets surprised by this. We're able to respond to the event rather than react to it. And I think that's about it, Chief, unless you would like to sign off. We have a couple of thank yous there. We can go uh, forward with the, with the thank you. So we'd like to thank uh, Superintendent Kevin Torrey. He's with the York Region Police. So uh, originally he was beside us here at uh, District 4, the building right beside us. So we had a very close re relationship with him. He's now down in headquarters. Uh, but we'd like to thank him for his support. And then obviously his staff, Bruce Valentine, who's the staff sergeant. Um, he helped go through the content of our presentation, just to make sure it was sound. And also Chris Armstrong, sergeant with York Regional Police. And obviously Constable Daniel, who was on the line with us today. Um, we'd like to thank uh, everyone for their involvement and their participation for logging on and uh, being interested, participating in uh, this, this forum. Obviously, community safety is uh, our number one priority and we just need to move forward as emergency services providers, as professionals, and ensure that we're ready for the uh, next incident. Wonderful. Thank you to all our speakers. That was incredible. The insight and the information collected just through that uh, 51 minutes was phenomenal. Thank you, guys. We do have a couple questions. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, so how do you sanitize the green route from IEDs as an EOD tech trained during IRA times? They often targeted the first responders, i.e. law enforcement officers and EOD. That was the first question we received. So I'm not sure, Rob, if you want to start off with that one. Yeah, thanks, uh, Renee. Um, Difficult to answer without breaching a lot of uh, protected information. Uh, I will say that if you encounter uh, improvised explosive devices on scene, the assessment process is what comes first. Um, you know, if, if there are, uh, if as long as our members don't hit a tripwire or 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 if the shooter themselves can't detonate remotely, uh, there's a quick assessment that's done, and based on that assessment. Uh, certain procedures are put into place in order to sanitize that, that green corridor. Unfortunately, to get into the actual specifics, I can't based on on uh, tactical protection and uh, the safety of the officers that might be on scene. The, uh, the fire department response there is, is very general officer. I can just, uh, I can give our two cents worth is that yes. you, you need as a company officer or, or platoon level officer to be aware of, of a cascading event. And that's that's that I think that's what you're referring to in the question is that uh, they, they try to draw first responders into the hot zone or the warm zone, and then they attack them again. Um, and that's that's actually addressed in the NFP document. They say you know you need education surrounding uh, precursor events or cascading events in any event that's that's going to become uh, uh, you know twofold where they, they they detonate something small or medium. There's a small precursor event. You need to have your senior command team that's on the pointy end of the stick thinking outside the box and, and, and aware of those types of things. But uh, I, I don't know if I can give much more information there or any than that, but that's, I mean, it's just education and being aware that that is always a threat. I don't know if you can completely sanitize or eliminate or engineer all the risk out of it, but there will always be that element of risk, but you do what you can to mitigate it and take all the necessary steps. Great, wonderful, thank you guys. All right, uh, another question from an attendee. Um, she was looking for clarification into who provides the senior leadership role uh, when it comes to the multi-agency response? Is it the police in that senior position? I think as, uh, so, as the lead uh, agent. Sorry, Constable. Yeah, go, go ahead, Chief. I, I just think that maybe Constable Daniel, because uh, these are criminal events that um, you would wanna speak on behalf of the police services mm -hmm. being the lead. Yeah, thank you. Um, that that is uh, that's exactly what we that's how we would approach it. That the policing agency of jurisdiction would would take the lead role in a active threat situation, and uh, but that unified command piece that Andrew had spoken about is critical in the sense of understanding everyone's capabilities. Uh, the final decision maker may be uh, in law enforcement, however without uh, interaction with the with the uh, integrated command structure uh, you're going you're not going to be as successful as you as you would hope absolutely and there's there's precedent now for that in, in the province of Ontario the Elliot Lake inquiry actually came out with a 600 page document saying if, if rescue is the primary 
focus, then fire is the lead agency. If it's criminal, it's the police. And if it's uh, medical, the EMS agency takes the lead. And that came out out of the uh, the mall collapse up there where there was some jurisdictional conflict. They had police trying to lead, fire leading. They, they were all collaborating for the same thing. And uh, and the, the, the judge who ruled on it wrote this big report. And he basically said, if, if, if your mandate is the primary function of why you're there, then you're the lead agency. And in most of the active threats, I can't think of any, um, the, the law enforcement agency will be taking the lead. And whether it's the first constable in, the corporal, the sergeant, whoever's there, you wanna, you wanna like, like Rob said, breach that. We're here, what do you need? What's your plan? How can we help? I think that's really important. And just, just to echo uh, what Andrew had said there, these are the, and he said in his presentation as well, these issues must be dealt with before any incident occurs. Because once boots are on the ground, if these issues aren't squared away and dealt with, you are going to have a serious problem on your hands that you do not want to be dealing with in one of these events. Wonderful. Thanks, guys. Okay, we've had some more questions that they've just flooded in right now. Um, how would everyone like to see security guards respond in the event of an active shooter? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, I guess I'll field it first. Um, well, in, I mean, it's a difficult way to answer that. I do not want somebody who has minimal training trying to interject or intervene with someone who is armed uh, with some type of, a, of, a, of an option, whether it be a knife, a gun. I mean, look at all the different ways uh, these people are, are, are finding to, to inflict harm on, on innocence. My, my hope is that they provide an excellent witness, that they can get information out to who it needs to get out to, that they can um, lock down the facility as best they can, that they have procedures and practices in place that allow them to know how to react, but to actually intervene with the, um, with the threat uh, is not something I'd like to see. And in fact, I go back to your regional police's uh, run, hide, defend. So follow that process uh, first before you decide to you know, try to intervene with the subject and, and, and put yourself in a very bad situation. I would, I would agree, Rob. I would think uh, any security officer who's working in a mall, uh, a large event, they're going to have an emergency plan and they'll, they'll, have, they'll have been trained or, or spoken to that. But I think you're right. The, uh, the first thing you do is, is fall back on your training. So if you're a security guard and there's, there's a threat immediately happening around you, help as many as you people can get out of there. And the run, hide, defend model is fantastic. Perfect, great advice. Um, moving right along then, there's another question that just came in. Uh, are there federally issued educational resources available to OHS committees uh, or even the public similar to York's uh, Run, Hide, Defend or the US DHS Run, Hide, Fight? Uh, from a, the RCMP standpoint, uh, I believe the Occupational Health Safety Committees that are out there, I don't think there's any literature that we provide however we do have like i said the safe plan that we uh implement uh throughout our, our jurisdictional schools that um would go to school boards and whatnot so that they have an understanding of of our capabilities and, and what our expectations would be uh in relation to best practices when it comes to defending against or or, or preparing for a potential active threat but no, we do not have any material out there from the RCMP standpoint that that uh, that uh, occupational health safety committees could could access. And, and just the, lo just locally from the far sorry, go ahead, Chief. No, I'll I'll talk after you. Go ahead. I was just going to say we've we've got an excellent rapport with our uh, in interior uh, health and safety rep, and he's very proactive with uh, emergency planning. We actually just did uh, drills in this building this week simulating an emergency. So uh, it, it really starts in, in the place where you work and, and having your health and safety committee be proactive is, is a really big part of that. Go ahead, Chief. A lot of the information that, uh, that we've received has come from our colleagues in the state. So through the International Association of Fire Chiefs and um, also through Homeland Security. So the US Department of Homeland Security, they have a, a lot of different documents that were provided to us. 
less. If I could add something to, uh, to what uh, Andrew said. Um, even though there's no literature provided by the if someone in an occupational health and safety committee or, or uh, like at, at the hospital or, uh, or, or, or stadium or wherever, well, there's a liaison officer that's typically assigned to these, to these assigned events, to these events and, and they would be able to provide um, any type of um, educational type of information, information required, required in order to have their staff and their facility their prepared their for uh, an unfortunate uh, event. Uh, an unfortunate event. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, that is it. We do have um, a couple other questions. Uh, thank you, Nicholas and Andrea. Um, I will get to you guys uh, after the webinar. Um, Thank you so much to our speakers. Thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, please fill out the survey that we are going to be sending out after this. Um, and if you learned anything, please pass it on. Tell your colleagues, uh, tell your friends. Um, there's some great material that we covered today. So once again, thank you to our webinar uh, sponsors, Tage and Aramid and Armor Express. Thank you again to all three of my amazing speakers, Rob, Darren, and Andrew. Um, and from all of us here at Blue Line, Canadian Security, and Firefighting in Canada, we thank you for joining us today. Till next time, bye for now.